Tanya Denise Tucker was born October 10, 1958. She is an American country music singer and songwriter who had her first hit, Delta Dawn, in 1972 at the age of 13. Over the succeeding decades, Tucker became one of the few child performers to mature into adulthood without losing her audience, and during the course of her career, she notched a streak of top 10 and top 40 hits. She has had several successful albums, several Country Music Association Award nominations, and hit songs such as 1973's What's Your Mama's Name, and Blood Red and Going Down, 1975's Lizzie and the Rainman, 1988's Strong Enough to Bend, and 1992's Two Sparrows in a Hurricane. Tucker's 2019 album While I'm Livin' won the Grammy Award for Best Country Album, and Bring My Flowers Now, from that same album won Tucker a shared songwriting Grammy for Best Country Song. Tucker was the youngest of four children born to Jesse Bo and Juanita Tucker. Her father was a heavy equipment operator, and the family moved often as he sought better work. Tanya's early childhood was spent primarily in Wilcox, Arizona, where the only radio station in town, Keel, played country music. The Tuckers attended concerts of country stars such as Ernest Tubb and Mel Tillis, and Tanya's sister Lacosta was praised in the family for her vocal abilities. At the age of eight, Tanya told her father that she also wanted to be a country singer when she grew up. When the Tuckers moved to St. George, Utah, Juanita took Tanya to audition for the film Jeremiah Johnson. Tanya did not win the bigger role for which she tried out, but she was hired as a bit player. About this time, she also got one of her first musical breaks, when her father drove the family to Phoenix for the Arizona State Fair, on the chance that the featured performer, country singer Judy Lynn, could use Tanya in her show. Tanya sang for the fair's entertainment managers, and she was engaged to sing at the fair itself. Tucker made her debut with Mel Tillis, who was so impressed by her talent that he invited her on stage to perform. In 1969, the family moved to Henderson, Nevada, where Tucker regularly performed. Eventually, she recorded a demonstration tape that gained the attention of songwriter Dolores Fuller, who sent it to producer Billy Sherrill, the head of artists and repertoire at CBS Records. Sherrill was impressed with the demo tape and signed the teenage vocalist to Columbia Records. Well, I mean, we're, we've just started back on the road. I've been off for about four years, and um, the Hall of Fame called, and we're, they wanted to do an exhibit. Uh, they called it the Strong Enough to Bend exhibit, and that got me back to Nashville, and from that time on, um, I ended up having all of a sudden, we got, all of a sudden I have a new manager, a new band, um, new agent, uh, and 60 dates booked on the road. So and, and it really was kind of before I was kind of ready, I guess. Yeah. But uh, ready or not, here I come. So um, we're we're just uh, we've got about to, well, they say 60 dates on the books, but I think they're I think they're fibbing. I think they've got a lot more than that. Wow. But we just we were in Oregon. Uh, we played Oregon last night before last. Flew all the way across the country this morning or yesterday morning, and uh, or actually last night and uh, got in late, late last night and uh, came to New York and then we're headed to um, Indiana, actually. That's funny, we're going to Indiana uh, when I get back. And you know, we, uh, we, there's not really any states that we don't really cover. We go everywhere. 
wherever they want in music, that's where we're going to be. So oh, That's great. So what do you like about touring at this point? What is exciting about it for you? Well, I think the most exciting thing is just the fact that, that we have so many great fans uh, that have been with me throughout my career over 45 years and, and uh, are still loyal and, and they still want to watch me perform. So, you know, I don't... I, I probably wouldn't make a dime if I, if, if I had to depend on me liking myself, so <laughs> I, I wouldn't buy any of my records, but uh, I'm sure glad somebody else does. You know, I, I, um, I have to keep thinking of different ways to make it exciting, and, mm -hmm. and usually the audiences, every one of them is a challenge. Not anyone is, even you could play the, sa the same place. We played Lincoln City, Oregon uh, for two nights. Mm -hmm beautiful hall and great sound and you know one of those places an entertainer really enjoys playing um i'm gonna hear myself when i'm singing and and uh, it actually sounds pretty good um because sometimes what i hear don't sound very good i'm thinking if that's what they're hearing uh, i'm really uh, i'm in big trouble but it was a great hall and but each night with two nights there different audiences yeah, yeah. but it's always a challenge and uh uh, and we have so many songs to pick from. I mean, my band is brand new, so they don't, they don't, they don't, they're not even close to knowing all my songs yet. Right. That's going to take a while. Yeah. And it, you know, it takes a while to get seasoned and, and uh, you know, being together, playing together. Uh, you can rehearse for a, a month or you, all, all you want, but getting on stage and performing is really where you really learn. It's unfortunate that you have to do it when you're on stage. But there's nothing, there's things that you cannot learn when you're practicing or rehearsing. And so at this point in my career, um, you know, even the mistakes uh, people enjoy. Yeah, so. sometimes those are the most enjoyable yeah. moments of a concert, I think. Exactly, because they don't happen all the time. And, and uh, I did one show one time, but I couldn't, I was a little, very hoarse and I didn't think I was going to be able to make it through the show. But uh, I got up there and just, uh, when you can't sing, you got to dance. And, and I had a great time, and, and uh, uh, I told the audience, I said, well, this might be the only time you get to see me uh, imitate Louis Armstrong for about an hour. <laughs> so this is a one-of-a-kind show. <laughs> but it was, uh, it's true that the special things are, are what happens sometimes that, uh, that are unexpected or just things that uh, go wrong. Sure. And believe me, if, it, if there's something that'll go wrong, it will go wrong with me. So. Has there ever been a moment that you think, okay, that was the worst thing that happened live or on tour? Well, there's been, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's been times uh, really, uh, I remember one time, my dad was always my manager and um, I was about, probably about 14. And back then, promoting country shows, I mean, I mean, it could be anybody. If they had a few hundred bucks, we'd be there. <laughs> And we got there, and uh, they were, the guy, the promoter, forgot to to, uh, to bring the speakers. So there was no speakers. So, But the place was packed, and uh, I asked my dad, I go, well, Daddy, well, what am I going to do now? And he said, sing real loud. <laughs> and so that's what I did, and and uh, everybody enjoyed it, and, and uh, nobody wanted their money back, and, and uh, we went, went on down the road. Yeah, and a, le a lesson learned. Got yes. our 600 bucks and on down the road yeah, we went. Right. Well, take me back to that time. You were 14 years old. You, j you had your first hit at 13. I mean, yeah. what was that like being at such a young age and, you know, thrust the stardom at that point? Well, it, you know, it really we didn't feel like stardom because I saw the the backs of the uh, kitchens and, and the, the back doors. I don't know. I don't even know what a front door looks like. And uh, so that's where I, it wasn't glamorous in any way. Played a lot of shopping centers. Uh, you know, when you're just starting out your career, uh, you have to go through all the stuff that you got to go through to to, uh, to get where you're going, where you're wanting to go. And uh, a lot of that stuff wasn't wasn't at all glamorous, and I certainly didn't feel like a star. And uh, so, of course, my dad made sure of that. Um, but uh, he uh, he was my mentor and helped me uh, with my performance and and my singing and everything. So 
um, he just said be real, just real with the people. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, that's the way I've always tried to be. But things do go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They and they still do. do. And they still do. Yeah. Well, you know, you have 60 dates this summer or this year, rather, and into next year to practice with your new well, band, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're going to be doing a lot of practicing. Yeah. So when you were 13, uh, and uh, do you remember that first musical moment when you were even younger than that, when you said, okay, this is what I want to be doing, you're singing around your house? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would sing for my dad, and he'd say, sing it again. That's not, you didn't put enough feeling in it. And he told me, he said, uh, you have a couple of problems. He said, one of them is that you're a girl, and this business has always been tough on, on girls. And he said, you're also a nine-year-old girl at that time when he told me. He said, so that means you're going to have to sing it with twice as much feeling. Put as, twice as much feeling as the, the artist that recorded it. So I've always kept that, and I've always been able to uh, come up with the feeling and whatever it, take, whatever it takes to get the song across. Sort of a little bit of acting, a little bit of uh, this, a little bit of real, you know, because you got to got to be honest but at the same time you're performing so that's in a in a kind of a way of a, just kind of an ir irony you know there's an irony with that because you got to be real but you're also pretending and uh, so I guess you got to be real good at it <laughs> <laughs> well, you eventually you got there so yeah you're here to talk about it today right, right so you mentioned about your dad saying you know that the industry is not you know kind to girls do you think we're in a better place now than we did when we, you got your first start in that oh, realm oh absolutely I mean now you have a hit record and you got nine buses and 19 semis and, and you know uh, things are, are they just take off back when I first started out it wasn't that way and uh, I didn't even have my own band until I was about 15. Been in the business for a couple of years, 13, 14, 15. Yeah, about three years. So I, you know, I, it was it was not easy singing with house bands. And my music really isn't jamming kind of music. You don't get up and sing. You know, it's not like singing Rocky Top or or you know getting up and singing Bobby McGee or something. I mean, my 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 music is complicated to play, and uh, it's not just. Uh, uh, get up and wing it, you know, and I'm particular, so um, um, just trying to, you know, every, every, every time I'm on stage is a new, it's a, it, it's a new uh, uh, challenge, and it's a new audience, it's, it's always, you know, I always find one more way to feel, huh. you know, there's, there's always, you think, well, I've just about felt everything. But it's not true. It'd be something else. I'll go out and I'll think, well, I never felt like this before. So it's it's always uh, something's always changing. But the, the 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 constant is is the fans and and just putting great music out, recording yeah. great songs. And I feel like you you push the boundaries a little bit in the in the musical genre. Can you talk a little bit about that and what you you, you try? Well, to I was talking about women and uh, you know it's it's. It's a lot different. I don't know if it's easier. I wouldn't say it's necessarily easier uh, in this business today. It maybe it might be even harder. Um, but there's just some things about it that might be a lot easier. You know, the way we get around and the way we get. You know, you know, Hank Williams was in the back, died in the back of a Cadillac going to a show. You know, so um, there's a lot of things. Uh, technology is 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 uh, is of course better. Um, got better quality sound. I'm not so sure that uh, some of it on the other side of that is sometimes you don't even have to be in the studio. Two people don't have to be in the studio together. They can just phone their part in, you know? I mean, I really like to be in the studio. I was just in, in uh, the studio with Charlie Pride and he's celebrating his 50th uh, uh, year in country music. And, and of course, uh, a hero of mine from when I was a kid. And, and to be able to, to sing a song with him now was, wow, it just, it, it, it was a great feeling. You, you don't get over that, you don't, I don't get over that. I, I'm always, uh, I, like, I like the fact that I, I'm impressed or I'm, you know, uh, a little nervous maybe around some of my heroes. Um, it's, it, I still feel, um, after all these years of being in this business, I still feel excited about it and excited to meet people that are in it as well. 
you know, everybody thinks we all hang out with each other. It's not true. We just, every, every now and then of award shows or uh, maybe coming to New York like this, I, I got to meet a few. I got to meet Daniel Radcliffe a while ago, and he was very nice. And uh, I go, my kids are going to just die when I tell them I met you. You know, uh, so it's always really wonderful to be able to uh, meet people that you've that you really uh, enjoy their talent and and look up to them and and uh, and and, uh, and find out they're pretty cool people too. You've met, you've collaborated with so many people over the years. Yeah. Uh, are there any favorites or or moments that st stand out? Well, I, I you know I I've, I've yet to really do the collaborations that I really want to do. I mean, I'm looking forward to taking that on um, and maybe doing a possible duet project with some, you know, some kind of people that maybe, I mean, I'm thinking Tom Petty. I always wanted to do something with Merle Haggard. And of course, uh, time ran out on that. And uh, that that makes me really very sad. But um, there, you know, different people. Uh, uh, Eric Clapton's one of my favorites. Um, love to do something with um, um, maybe uh, one of the new boys, like maybe Keith or, or Blake or one of those guys might be fun. But I, 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 I still have a lot left to do in that you think, you know, you run out of, you know, some, my, my daughter, someone was telling me yesterday, how they're gonna run out of, run out of ideas for songs. How, how can they come up with, you know, look like everything has been said. But it's amazing, it's just like poetry, you know, it just comes out of uh, different people, it comes out different ways. And uh, there's always gonna be something, something new. And um, in this kind of business that, I, that I'm in, there are always new, there's never, you're never at the top of the mountain. You're, you're always, I feel like, I always feel like I'm looking at Mount Everest and I'm putting my hiking boots on, you know, going, well, I'm fixing to get up there and uh, I'm getting up there someday, but never feel, I never feel like I'm there yet. It's always a journey. And, uh, but uh, anytime I can collaborate with people that I really respect and, and, and enjoy uh, their talent is always, wow, makes me feel, makes me feel great. And, and it's uh, something that I enjoy doing. I would love to see that duets album. I'm sure you're fans. I would. Too. I mean, I Paul really, Petty and Clapton, get them on board. Yeah, I would love it. And Dylan, I'd love to do something with Bob. He's been wanting to do something. And uh, you know, these guys ain't getting any younger, and neither am I. So we need to get. We need to get to it. You need to get going. You got to get yeah. calling. Do you have another album in the works? Or? I have one in the can right now that I've had for a while. It's just needs a few little things. Uh, just a few little things would would have it done. Uh, it's not mixed yet or anything, but uh, I think it's the best I've done. I, I really, I think what what makes me say that is, of course, I've been in, involved in every part of it, in every little vessel, every little intricate detail. I've been there. Every bass player that I've had five times on one track, <laughs> I couldn't get the right bass sound. Uh, so I've been involved more with this album than I have ever been with a record and uh, involved with the songs and the songs are feel they it's just not just um, uh, singing a song and then uh, then feeling that way it's it's hearing a song and making it my own I've tried to always do that but I think these songs tell more about where I, I am at right now in my life and uh, 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 an older, hopefully a little wiser. And, um, you know, people talk about legend and I said, legend in my spare time. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm not a, I don't look, I don't walk around the house looking in, in the mirror saying, oh, I'm a legend, you know, hey, <laughs> I've done it all. I, uh, I've got a lot of things left to do. I love hearing that. Um, throughout your 45-year career, you have amassed a lot of things as well, and I understand right. you're you're um, putting them to charity and selling some yes. of them on auction, right? Yes, everything but the house, ebth.com. Um, I've partnered with them, and uh, um, I had 15,000 square foot warehouse just full of stuff that I've collected and that I've worn and had, and and uh, 
my life, really my life, my whole life. And I just thought, you know, it's just collecting dust. Mm -hmm. Somebody might can enjoy some of this stuff. And of course, you know, I had to consider my kids and things that they'd wanted and they'd want of mine and um, different things like that. And maybe later on, they talk about doing a museum or something. That seems way, <laughs> way a little, uh, a little too soon for me right now, a museum. <laughs> but uh, they talk about maybe later doing that. So I'm trying to keep some things for that. But, you know, I just thought, well, if um, I'm just spread the love and, and it also goes to a great charity and helping uh, musicians and artists or singers that are down on their luck, which Lord knows can happen every now and then. Yeah, it's nice that it goes to a good cause. How do you go about thinking, okay, I'm going to keep this versus I'm going to donate oh, this? It's, it's very emotional. Yeah. It really is emotional. You know, I... Uh, I can't tell you, I can't, I, I'd be lying if I told you it wasn't pretty tough to let some things go. But I'm thinking, what, you know, what am I going to do? You know, put it on and uh, die with it, you know? I mean, don't take it wherever I'm going after this life. And um, uh, so I thought, you know, instead of just sitting in a warehouse, I'm paying uh, uh, every month to keep it, uh, keep it up. I might as well get rid of that because it's just kind of, it's almost like a burden but and a release. So, you know, I've had to say to myself, just let it go, let it go. You know, someone will enjoy it, you know. So I, I'm hoping that 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 uh, is uh, is was, is going to work out good and and my I'm hoping that that, that all works out well. But, uh, you know, you never know. Yeah, Never but know. then you'll have stuff that you'll keep too. And well, I can always go out and buy some new you stuff. Can, you can, you can. Yeah. You're also getting an ACM honor or award, right? And that's yes. coming up this year. What's this all about? Well, it's uh, the Cliffy Stone, uh, actually the Pioneer Award, uh, where they give to people that have, I guess, done a lot in, in uh, music and for for our music. And um, I'm in good company with Crystal Gale and Glenn Campbell is also being honored. And... Uh, so I'm, I'm very, and Cliffy Stone was a very good friend of mine from the old days and I always knew Cliffy and, and he was always one of those guys that was always around, you know, um, and one of those people that you needed to know. And so I'm very honored to, to, uh, to be honored and to be recognized. It's, it's always nice. I love that. Well, congratulations on that and everything else you have going on. Thank we you. have a, a crowd here with some questions for you, uh, so we'd love to get Don't make going. it too hard. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, keep them easy. <laughs> hey, how you doing? I really appreciate your words, by the way. Um, I'm a performer myself, and it really gets hard sometimes to keep on going. And you're obviously successful, so um, what are some words that you can give performers to keep on going and not stopping and to believe in themselves? Because that's obviously something we struggle with a lot. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, of course you gotta keep on, like Billy Ray Cyrus said, uh, keep on swinging, you'll get a hit, you know? But uh, I think part of that has to be inside of you. I mean, I, I look back on my life and think, wow, I should have got frustrated at that point. If I'd have been, me then, if I'd been me now, I probably would have gotten more frustrated. I probably would have quit. But um, for some reason, I never did. And I'm, I guess that my dad told me one thing one time. He said, he said, you know, you don't have to be in love with what you have to go through to get to your goal. But you have to be in love with your goal. And you have to want to be there. And if you have to go through all this to get there, then that's so be it. You just got to want to be able to do that. But you know, don't give up. And then there's times when you know, I see some people that should give up, you know. <laughs> you got a good laugh out of that one. <laughs> but uh, it just depends, you know. You know, and a lot of people have told, I've, you know, heard, everybody's heard that story one time or another. Oh, go back to driving trucks, they told Elvis, you know. I bet that guy felt like yeah, a fool. But, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to say. Um, you just got to keep on trucking. 
Wise words, Tanya. Uh, so, throughout the course of your career, what was the most surprising venue or town that you performed in that, as far as turnout goes? Because I know I've been to a, country, a couple of country shows out in New York City, even the Barclays Center, and it would be filled to the rafters. And normally, country music isn't associated with a town like New York, yes. but the people are there. No, we, there... Have, we have some of our best crowds, actually, really, uh, up, uh, up here and in the north and in, in the Midwest. We really do. We've never had that problem. We've had in Canada. Uh, I was in Toronto one time, and I had the choice between going to Toronto and believe me, if I was, if it asked me again today, I'd say it'd be a different answer. But I had the choice between going to uh, Tahiti or going to a place in Canada in Toronto that was uh, you had to wear a suit and tie to get in, and it was all you know, very very. Uh, uh, just how would you say it um, it wasn't country or at all I mean you had to have a jacket and tie and my dad was in the audience and I of course chose to work because nobody in the, country, in the country music industry had ever filled it and it was a hundred dollars a ticket and back then it's been quite a few years ago hundred dollars was a lot for a ticket especially to come, come see a country act and I wanted to take that challenge on. So I, I went ahead and accepted the date. We played there four or five days. But the best story about that is Bob Dylan came in and they wouldn't let him in because he didn't have a jacket. And he goes, if I could just hear blood red and going down, would you lay with me? I'd be cool, man. <laughs> and, and the maitre d' says, sir, you cannot come in like that. You have to have a jacket, you know. <laughs> And so my dad overheard all this. He said, mother, he said, mother, go up and get my jacket. So he come, she come back down and brought, it, brought Bob Dylan the jacket. So they put it on him and he sat at their table and watched my show. And of course, um, um, I uh, got a note up on stage saying that Bob Dylan's on the audience. And I thought it was a joke. So I said, can you imagine Bob Dylan singing Delta Don? She's 41. And, and so I was just imitating him, not knowing he was in the audience. And when I came off stage, there was my dad standing there with Bob Dylan. And I went, oh my God. So they, he came up to the room and I had to do a little press. And, and uh, I, hell, he was there for about five hours. I think it was daylight before he left. But we, had a, we, we started a relationship and, and have uh, been friends ever since. What a story. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for your great questions. We got an amazing story out of it. And uh, hopefully, we'll, maybe we'll see Bob Dylan and you on a record at some oh, point. Oh, yeah, I would love it. Well, he, I went to see him in Nashville uh, about a year or two ago. And uh, he said, man, he goes, I got a song. You got to sing with me. You know, we got to do this. I'm, hey, I'm waiting. You're you know? waiting. Well, we're waiting, too. Thank you so much for your time today. I love it. Thank, thank you, you all. Everybody. Thank you. In 1978, she decided to radically change her image and cross over to rock with her TNT album. Despite the controversy over the record and its sexy cover, it went gold the following year. The two hit singles from the album were, I'm a Singer, You're the Song, and Texas, When I Die. The latter reached number 5 on the country charts, and its B-side, Not Fade Away, a Buddy Holly cover, peaked at number 70 on the Hot 100 pop charts. By the end of the 1970s, her sales were declining in 1980. She only had two hits, one of them was, Can I See You Tonight? Also in 1980, she recorded a few singles with Glenn Campbell, with whom she was romantically linked. In addition to recording, she also made her feature film debut in Hard Country, although she did have small roles in Jeremiah Johnson, 1972, and the television miniseries The Rebels, 1979. Despite having a top 10 hit in March 1983, Feel Right, from her first and only Arista album Changes, she struggled to have her music played on the radio. By mid-1983, her singles were no longer making the top 40. Her famous amours included country singer Merle Haggard, who was 21 years her senior, actor Don Johnson, pop singer Andy Gibb, and most notably, Glenn Campbell, with whom she had a stormy relationship and a minor hit duet, Dream Lover. She moved to Nashville after her breakup with Campbell in 1982 and began to lead a more secluded life. Finally, in 1988, her family confronted her and persuaded her to enter the Betty Ford Center. 
At first, Tucker rebelled against her treatments, but after private counseling sessions, she began to improve. In 1986, Tucker signed with Capitol Records. She returned to the charts with One Love at a Time, which climbed to number three. Her career was revitalized with 1986's Girls Like Me, an album that spawned four top 10 country singles. In 1988, she had three number one country singles, I Won't Take Less Than Your Love, with Paul Davis and Paul Overstreet, If It Don't Come Easy, and Strong Enough to Bend. Her music was now more country pop styled and up-tempo, but this material made Tucker popular again. Between 1988 and 1989, Tucker enjoyed one of her most popular years on the charts, racking up eight country top ten hits in a row. Her albums around this time were also achieving gold certifications by the RIAA, after selling 500,000 copies. A Greatest Hits album followed in 1989. It also contained a new single called, My Arms Stay Open All Night. Radio responded well, the song peaked at number 2. In 1988, Tucker was nominated by the Country Music Association for Female Vocalist of the Year, and was nominated for other major awards during this time. Her contribution to the country music genre was rewarded when the Country Music Association voted her the Female Vocalist of the Year in 1991, though she missed the event, having just given birth to her second child. Eight consecutive singles reached the top 10 in the early 1990s, including, Down to My Last Teardrop, Without You, What Do I Do With Me, and Two Sparrows in a Hurricane. In 1990, Tucker was named Female Video Artist of the Year, by CMT. Although by the 1990s, she no longer had number one hits, many singles came close peaking in the country top five, as well as the top 10. Tucker was one of the most successful female country artists at the time. She became one of the few teen stars to find success in her adult years. Her 1993 album Greatest Hits 1990-1992 rose to number 15, and also went to number 18 on the Top Country Albums chart. Liberty Records was changed to Capital Nashville in 1994. By the 1990s, Tucker was a 20-year veteran in country music, though she was only in her mid-30s. In 1994, Hangin' In was her last top 5 hit, as well as her last top 10 hit for a while. That year, she performed at the halftime show at Super Bowl 28. In 1996, she was one of the top 10 most played artists of the year, and at the time was also Capitol Records' biggest signed female artist. In 1997, she returned to the top 10 on the country charts for the last time with the hit, Little Things, which peaked at number 9. That year she was inducted into the Texas Country Music Hall of Fame. In 2002, Tucker founded Tucker Time Records, allowing her to retain control of the recording process and release the singles she wished to release. The same year, she issued Tanya, her first album in five years, which was distributed through Capitol Records. The album was produced by her fiancé, Jerry Lassiter, and included a guest vocal by Vince Gill. In 2005, she released an album, Live at Billy Bob's Texas. In 2005, she also contributed two songs to a tribute album to Bob Wills, called a tribute to Bob Wills' 100th anniversary. In 2005, she released a book, 100 Ways to Beat the Blues on Fireside, which included tips on shaking the blues, from some of Tucker's friends such as Willie Nelson, Brenda Lee, Little Richard, and Burt Reynolds. Tucker recorded an album, Lonesome Town, which has been put on hold, but a live concert recorded at the Renaissance Center in December was to be released. Tucker sang a duet with country music artist Billy Joe Shaver, of Shaver's song, Played the Game Too Long, on his latest album, Everybody's Brother, that was released in September 2007. In 2009, Tucker signed a one-time deal with Saguaro Road Records from Time Life. Tanya's Lonesome Town project was put on hold to do the first cover album of her career, My Turn, which was released in June 2009 and placed number 27 on the Billboard country charts. The first single, Love's Gonna Live Here, was released to radio and was also available as a digital single. It is a remake of the classic hit by Buck Owens.
The album includes classic country hits such as Wind Me Up, Lovesick Blues, You Don't Know Me, Ramblin' Fever, Walk Through This World With Me, Big Big Love, Crazy Arms, After the Fire Is Gone, and Oh Lonesome Me. Tucker appeared on Terry Clark's 2012 album Classic in a remake duet of her first single, Delta Dawn. In June 2017, Tucker was featured in Rolling Stone as one of the 100 greatest country artists of all time. After the death of former Flame Glenn Campbell on August 8, 2017, Tucker released her first single since 2009, Forever Loving You, a song co-penned by Tennessee State Senator Rusty Crowe. The song's release the following day, on the eve of Campbell's funeral, drew ire and criticism being exploitative. Tucker claimed that a portion of the proceeds will benefit the Alzheimer's Foundation of America, but the foundation stated it was not involved in the promotion and has not received any funds. Tucker released While I'm Living, her first collection of original material since 2002's Tanya, in 2019 via Fantasy Records. It was produced by Shooter Jennings and Brandy Carlisle, with Carlisle brought onto the project after initially being approached for songs by Jennings but after having professed such an admiration of Tucker and her work, Jennings felt it necessary for her to co-produce the record alongside him. Tucker performed, Bring My Flowers Now, at Loretta Lynn's All-Star 87th birthday concert at Nashville's Bridgestone Arena with Carlisle playing piano. The album's first single, Hard Luck, was released on June 28, along with its accompanying music video. On June 25, 2019, the New York Times Magazine listed Tanya Tucker among hundreds of artists whose material was reportedly destroyed in the 2008 Universal Fire. On January 26, 2020, Tanya Tucker won her first two Grammy Awards for, Bring My Flowers Now, and, While I'm Living. Tucker is one of the few and best-known female country singers to be classified as an outlaw in the outlaw country movement, which was most popular in the late 1970s. As Tucker matured by the end of the 1970s, her outlaw image grew. Like the other outlaw artists in the business at the time, Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Chris Christopherson, Waylon Jennings, Jesse Coulter, Emmy Lou Harris, David Allen Coe, Hank Williams Jr., Tucker was able to combine qualities of country and rock music into her voice to make the outlaw sound that was popular at the time. These qualities could be heard on some of her biggest hits at the time, including 1978's Texas When I Die. Tucker also had a spirit of independence, which was another outlaw quality. She ranked number 9 on CMT's Dozen Greatest Outlaws, the only woman to appear on that list. As the 1980s progressed, Tucker continued to add the outlaw qualities to her hits. At the beginning of the 1990s, Tucker was still identified as an outlaw. Today, Tucker continues to be recognized as one, regularly attending outlaw events among regular shows. Gretchen Wilson made reference to Tucker in her 2004 hit song, Redneck Woman, and Tucker appears briefly in the video of the song, showing Tucker with other outlaws.